Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hi there. Didn't see you come in. You know, while everyone's wasting their time during this pandemic, binge watching TV shows or talking to their parents on Zoom, I've dedicated my time to a much higher calling, internet research. And folks, you won't believe what your old friend Big Hoss has uncovered lately. I'm talking about reptilian overlords living in your shoes, 5G infused breakfast cereals. This one right here is talking about how Chuck E. Cheese and Mr. Blobby are running a sweatshop for velour tracksuits. Forget Q, I'm going A to Z on this whole thing. Now you might ask yourself, how can I pull all this off while avoiding all these nefarious forces conspiring against us on a global level? Here's the Iggy on Surfshark VPN. Surfshark protects your online activity better than a tinfoil hat. It keeps your most precious data safe from prying eyes by keeping your location private and your sensitive data secure. We're talking passwords, DMs, the works. But if you'd rather be a sheeple watching Netflix all day instead of opening your eyes to the truth, well, Surfshark can help you with that too. Avoid censorship, region-locked streaming sites, and the man by hopping to one of thousands of global servers. Take it from me, folks. Everything on the internet is true. And now you can see it all thanks to Surfshark. Support the channel by downloading it using the link in the description. Save 83% with the promo code REGRET and get three extra months for free. They found us. Who is it? Uh, pizza for Big Hoss McGraw. Oh, okay. Be right there. Excuse me. Uh, Y'all better remember the muffin gimmick this time. I'm a hip. So what was the cause for all that success the World Wrestling Federation had in the late 90s and early 2000s? Was it the edgy content? Was it the stars they were making like Stone Cold and The Rock and D-Generation X? No, 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 my friends. The answer is the McMahons. It's always been the McMahons. And this week's show proves that theory with WrestleMania 2000. Actually, you know, funny story about that. On TV, it's never actually addressed as WrestleMania 2000 or WrestleMania 16. It's just WrestleMania. They don't say, come watch WrestleMania 2000. Welcome to WrestleMania 2000. It's just WrestleMania. So in that way, I think this show is kind of like the Ewoks of WWE. April 2nd, 2000, from the Arrowhead Pond in Anaheim, California. This show was nominated by The Lad Robert Hunter, Thomas Fireheart, Dave Bennett, Justin I, Tim Whalen, Jared Sedwick, John the Wolverine, Justin Escoto, Derek Gray, Alan Jolly, Michael Earhart, and Sam Adelaide over at patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret. WrestleMania at the height of the Attitude Era. On paper, it shouldn't get better than that, but we will be proven wrong as the show goes along. This show is known for a couple of things. The fact that there's almost no singles matches to speak of. We do get pretty much the birth of what will become the TLC match, which is historical in its own right. But also, most importantly, a McMahon in every corner for the main event. Yes, even the one who can't talk very well. It is the most important thing about this show. More important, in fact, than the reason they're in this match to begin with. But we'll get to that a whole lot later. Actor Keith David narrates part of the opening hype package, which is cool to hear. I love these graphics for the four-way by the way, with the faces swooping past each other. 19,776 people sell out the pond in Anaheim, now the Honda Center. 824,000 pay-per-view buys, which is only a slight increase from 800,000 the previous year, Mania 15. Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler are on commentary. Pretty underwhelming set, if I'm being honest here. The version they had in No Mercy is pretty underwhelming, but I forgot how bad and boring the real thing looked. Our first match in the evening sees The Godfather and D'Lo Brown teaming up against the Big Boss Man and Bull Buchanan. And if you watch this on the network version, you see a bunch of people to suddenly teleport into the ring after the opening pyro and everything because they cut The Godfather's entire entrance because Ice-T raps his theme from the Aggression album that had just come out and they're pushing pretty hardcore here. Check my review on that if you want to learn more about it. I believe the lyrics to this song go something like, Pimpinate, Pimpinate, Easy Man. 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 Pimp or die, pimpinate, pimpinate, easy man. 
So it's cops versus pimps, that classic rivalry, but why are these two teams fighting at WrestleMania? Couldn't tell you. I watched all the programming leading up to this, and, you know, they started fighting. It was just one day, the boss man and Buchanan start picking a fight with the Godfather and D'Lo, and that's literally it. There's no promos to really beef this up. Bull Buchanan has recently re-debuted on TV. He was formerly recon of the Truth Commission, sent to OVW for two years for seasoning before finally re-debuting as the boss man's sidekick. They never explain the relationship between these two outside of saying he's somebody from boss man's past in Georgia and he has a checkered past. That's literally all you get for character work. The Godfather with his most unique look for this character is definitely a mania attire for this one. The cowboy boots, the Rick James blouse, the white baggy pants. It's impeccable. I don't think he ever rocks this look again. The heels begin to take over in the match. A double slide attack by boss man and bull. King Corbin needs to add this move to his repertoire. Buchanan with a mean looking axe kicked a friend of the show. D'Lo who kicks out. Some sneaky fake tags by the baddies. D'Lo's in the bear hug. He fights out of it but gets snuffed out and Bossman yells, we are the man! Bully goes up top but Godfather shakes the ropes and he gets crotched. Hurricane Rana by D'Lo. The Godfather's hot tagged in. We get the hoe train. D'Lo gets back in the ring. He gets moving but he walks right into a boss man slam. Then a hellacious top rope leg drop by Buchanan. They pick up the win and they chase off the hose. This one gets two and a half stars out of five for me. Pretty solid opener. Kind of right down the middle for me in terms of quality. I think for his first real big test on a big pay-per-view stage as his gimmick. Bull Buchanan did fairly well, I think. And of course, actually, you know what? I'm going to give it an extra half star just for the Godfather's look. We go backstage to see Triple H and Stephanie McMahon Helmsley hanging out in their dressing room. They're the power couple. They're both champions. Last week on SmackDown, Stephanie was put into a match by Vincent Mann against the women's champion Jacqueline in a title match. She was very scared and unprepared for it, but thanks to some heavy DX cheating in a very short affair, the hapless Stephanie became the women's champ. And speaking of titles, it's time for the Hardcore Battle Royal for the Hardcore Championship, and here are your participants. You got Taz, Viscera, the Mean Street Posse, Hardcore Holly, Kai and Tai, the Headbangers, the APA, and of course the champion himself, Crash Holly. A few weeks ago on SmackDown, Crash famously declared he was going to defend his title 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's the birth of the 24-7 era, and all the wacky scenes that came along with it. Fighting in the laundromat, a hotel room, Funland USA, of course, and so forth. All these lower card guys chasing after him every week through the arena right into the APA's office. And by the way, I love the detail where they all fight their way through the door to get in trying chasing after him. Great stuff there. Finally, Crash has had enough. He can't sleep. He can't eat or rest. So he begs for some time off before this match here. It's a 15 minute time limit. The title can change hands any number of times in that window. But when time expires, the last man with the belt is the champion. And by the way, all the title changes that happen in this matchup are part of the official championship championship legacy for the hardcore title and the history of Reigns. Unlike in 2009, where I still believe Brian Kendrick should have been called a WWE champion. Taz beats Crash right out the gate with a suplex to become the champion, but about a minute later, Viscera flattens him to win the belt. The weapons come out and it's a big prop battle. Crash is bleeding. Viscera bashes Pete Gas with a fan. Bradshaw swings a baking shit like a madman. Rodney's clobbered in this match. There's so many headshots with all these weapons to everybody. Viscera holding onto his belt for quite a while here. He's the longest reigning champion in this match. He inexplicably goes up top and the APA beal him off though. They lay him out, drop both guys from Kayantai onto him. They get the cover and Funaki is the new champion. He flees to the backstage area and the rest follow. Rodney wins the belt, then Joey Abs beats his own teammate for it. Thrasher of the Headbangers claims the title and staggers back to the arena. A bloody Joey Abs pins him to win. Holy shit, what happened to him? He looks like a mess. Taz suplexes the poor bastard on the floor and regains the title. We get an ECW chant in the final three minutes. Taz Taz and the Hollies in the ring while everyone else for some reason just fighting on the outside. Down to Taz and Bob with one minute remaining. Pete Gas still looks gross. Crash decks Taz and pins to regain the belt with 36 seconds left. He acts like he's won, but then Taz gets the Kata Hajime locked in on him. I think this makes Crash the person who's been in that hole the absolute longest in history without tapping out because he's holding on to it finally with seconds to go. Hardcore Holly bashes a candy jar over Crash's head and covers. Tim White stops the count for some reason before three. They say Crash kicked out. He didn't. The time expires, and after a whole lot of confusion, suddenly Hardcore is announced the winner. Oh my, things are awkward. Apparently what was meant to happen was Crash was supposed to escape just by a frog's hair with a championship. Time was supposed to expire before Tim White counted the three, and he was being fed a countdown time in his ear, and I guess he was being given the wrong time because he got came down early. He had to pull his, his last count, and it made everything look bad and everything awkward, so they had to kind of cover for 
for it. And they show the replay a few more times after this match happens, which does not help things. It doesn't clear anything up and they don't ever acknowledge, well, we screwed up or the referee screwed up or Crash should be the champion. Like nothing was re resolved with that. They just show the replay to show how they really messed up. But in the end, they got what they wanted anyway because the next night on Raw, Crash beat Hardcore to regain the title. How about I could start with you right here and right now. No, it doesn't matter to me, Michael Cole, because I will break your ass in half, you little shithead. I give it one star out of five. You know, it was ugly throughout, and the finish definitely knocked it down even more so. But before that, I think there were a couple of good moments, a couple of moments of brilliance in this matchup. But yeah, I mean, it was a good way to get a whole bunch of mid-card guys on the card, and this is probably the time when the 24-7 era for the championship really hit its peak, even though it dragged on for a long time after that. But I think Crash started the 24-7 gimmick at this time in its infancy. It was fresh. It was very entertaining. Like I mentioned the Funland USA stuff earlier. Earlier, all those 24-7 gags were really funny and again it's hard to talk about it now knowing what like the 24-7 gimmick has kind of like been bastardized as today but just back then 20 years ago 21 years ago now it's like ah it was really fun we get a recap of the fan access event a very long recap indeed everyone is saying the same thing it's great the fans are great the booths are great the weekend is great Wrestlemania is big and great yay great we get Al Snow backstage in a Tracy Smothers t-shirt talking to someone in the bathroom stall when Steve Blackman walks in. He's got no time for Al's shenanigans, but oh, little does he know. Then BAM! Here's some boobs for you. So for weeks, Al's been trying to get his new tag team partner, Steve Blackman, to grow a personality. Uh, he's been trying to make him embrace the wackier side of things. He wants to name the tag team Head Cheese. He wants to give him like an alien sidekick or travel back through time to meet Benjamin Franklin and Abe Lincoln. He tried to set Blackman up with a blind date to get him to, to cut loose a bit more, or milk a cow, I guess. That helps build personality. All these things, though, Steve soundly rejects because he's far too serious and boring for any of Al's wacky business. But I will say the, the, the dynamic between these two is pretty funny. Steve was some brilliant deadpan compared to Al Snow, and he's just trying so hard to help his friend get a personality. And so in a lot of ways, I really dug the head cheese angle during this time. And now on a match that, once again, has never been really established why it's happening here. There was not a whole lot of great build for this one. Head Cheese takes on the new tag team of T and A, Test and Albert, who are managed and brought together by the debuting former fitness model, Trish Stratus. On an episode of Heat, she officially debuted and recruited Test and Albert to be part of her team. And now they're called T and A because they love double entendre. Al Snow's got a surprise for Steve. Their new mascot, Chester McCheeserton, a small man in a cheese costume with holes cut out of the butt, and he spanks his butt with a let's go head cheese chant. I know I said I liked the Al Snow Steve Blackman shtick overall, but even I have my limits. JR's headset malfunctions as the match begins, so Lawler rides solo for a while. Albert catches an Al Snow kick but takes an enziguri. The match has a hard time finding a good groove here. Albert takes a lot of the heat, which is odd considering he's the heel. Chester gets near Trish on the outside, prompting Lawler to call him Chester the Molester. TNA with a huge double powerbomb to Snow. Lots of double teaming and the referee not doing many five counts. Blackman's back in the ring. Snow with an acai and moonsault. There's a double team move that does not pay off. The crowd's very quiet for this very clunky match. A press slam by Albert to Steve, test the elbow drop, TNA win. I give it a half star out of five. This match was just a rough go the entire time and like no one was into it. Jim Ross on commentary saying this match had bowling shoe tendencies and then when the bell sounded after the match was over he's saying this match never got on track. Wrestlemania baby! In fact my favorite part of this match is at the end when Al brings in Chester McCheeserton carrying him like a child and sliding him into the ring and then he and Steve is beating the bejesus out of him for a couple of minutes. Backstage the Cat and Mae Young do a recreation of that one gag from the Austin Powers movies and then elsewhere the Dudley Boys talk about their triangle ladder match. Devon divulges he's scared of heights, and Bubba says they're going to take things to a whole new level tonight. And take it to a new level they do in the triangle ladder match for the Tag Team Championships as the Dudleys defend against Edge and Christian and the Hardy Boys, three teams making their WrestleMania debuts. The Dudleys beat the New Age Outlaws at No Way Out to win their first tag titles in the Federation, have since gone on to mercilessly attack an elderly woman. Meanwhile, the Hardys and ENC have been warring since their epic ladder match the previous year. Edge and Christian and accuse the Hardys of being full of themselves. Well, they may be full of something, but one thing you can't accuse them of being full of here at this point in their careers is charisma. The Dudleys pose dramatically on the ladder as the other two teams start things off. The Hardys start using ladders first. Jeff going for a 450 onto Bubba on a ladder, but Bubba moves. I forgot Jeff ever did 450s, honestly. Then Bubba just takes his own high back bump into a ladder from the second rope. Yikes. Edge with a ladder sandwich on Jeff. Bubba with a ladder copter spot. Christian climbs a ladder and dives to the outside onto Bubba and Matt. 
Jeff climbing a ladder, but Edge dives off the top and spears him off. Very prophetic to what would happen at WrestleMania 17. Minutes later, Bubba hits Christian with a cutter off the ladders. Then the Hardys hit double flying moves off the ladders onto Bubba. All three teams on ladders now. Christian and Jeff take a nasty spill to the cameras, almost miss. And the other four men all fall down. Just wild stuff here. The Dudleys squish Christian with ladders, the 3D to Edge. Then it's time to bring out the tables, and the crowd loves seeing this. They begin to make a structure with the ladders and table. The action is slowed way down now, and the crowd's waiting for the next move, basically. Devon missing a splash on Jeff through a table in the ring, but Bubba power bombs Matt through a table on the outside. Jeff hops the rail and takes a disgusting ladder to the face. Somehow the match is not done yet. Bubba placing a massive ladder on the ramp, setting up some tables. Christian knocks Bubba out with the ring bell, and that allows Jeff to do his iconic dive off the ladder and through the table. A legend was made on that night for sure. Matt and Christian on the table up top. Edge shows up. They knock Matt off and through a table below. Edge and Christian grab the belt and they win. I give it four and a half stars out of five. This is the best match on this card. It's a tight race between this and a match we'll see later on, I think. But this one, I think, just tops it because it is so innovative. It is so different to what we were seeing at the time. And what we saw the Hardys and Edge and Christian do in 1999 with the ladder match was just, again, like Bubba said, very prophetic words, taking things to a whole new level with the third team and the inclusion of the tables and everything. All these pieces coming together to what ultimately lead to the first official TLC match at that year's SummerSlam. And this one is just a lot of fun to watch. And it's crazy to see how, how, how ridiculous some of these stunts can get. And we've seen probably more extreme stunts since then, but this was the, this was the originator, I think. And what's crazy to think is, you know, 21 years later, four of the six guys are still actively wrestling right now. Right now. How crazy is that? Kevin Kelly is backstage with Mick Foley and his corner woman, Linda McMahon. Mick Foley fighting in the main event and what they're saying could be his last match. Lol says he wants a second chance to make a last impression and wants people to talk about this match for the next 10 years. Eh, well, they won't. In your one and only singles match on the card of this WrestleMania, you've got a cat fight as the cat takes on Terry. These two ladies have been feuding exclusively in the world of GTV. Terry mocks the cat for not being on TV much lately. The cat's very petty and returns a top she borrowed from Terry and it's ruined. And this is the genesis of your WrestleMania match here. This match also saw the fabulous Moolah and Mae Young in the corners of Terry and the cat respectively, these former best friends now feuding. I mean, Mae Young had a hell of a 2000 folks because one day after for no way out. She famously gave birth to a hand, and then after that, she was power bombed multiple times through tables by the Dudley Boys. And Mark Henry, who is you know Mae Young's lover at this point, he's written off soon after the hand birth. He goes to OVW for for seasoning for a while, so he's not a part of this storyline at all after the power bombs and everything. But Mula, it turns heel because she sold Mae out and and set her up to be attacked by the Dudleys again, and because she's stealing the spotlight. And Mula's been put in the back burner, and now she doesn't care if the bitch ever comes back. Howard Finkel introduces the cat fight, which gets a collective way from the crowd. Is our special cat fight. Yes! Yes! And the rules. Val with the referee towel and his very unfortunate jizz shirt. JR warns us this match will have no arm drags, no fireman's carries. Says not to use the star system, folks. I'm sorry, JR, but a job is a job. The match begins where the first woman thrown out of the ring is the loser. Val tries to break up the roll around. Terry plants one on Val, who then drops her and kisses the cat. Terry and Cat roll around a bit, may distract Val, which is honestly, she's the best part of this whole thing, but he misses Terry being eliminated. I give it negative one star, and the only reason I'm keeping it anywhere close to the border between the negative and positive stars is because of Mae Young's contributions. She, if you want to call it that, she saved this matchup. She was the most entertaining part of the whole thing. But everything else, to quote Terry herself in the build for this, Trash! The Radicals getting ready backstage. Eddie Guerrero can't stop thinking about China and says she can't handle his Latino heat. We go to our six-person tag team match now as the Radicals, Malenko, Saturn, and Guerrero take on Too Cool and China. Of course, the Radicals, along with Chris Benoit, who we will be seeing later tonight, uh, they all jumped ship from WCW en masse one night after their sold-out pay-per-view, and they shortly afterward became heels and became kind of Triple H's henchmen for the better part of 2000. And uh, Too Cool and Rikishi 
Nishi Fatu, constantly warring with DX and the Radicals by proxy. China has now been kind of helping out Too Cool in their fight. And on the SmackDown before this WrestleMania, Eddie, who by the way has been beating up China a lot in these last couple weeks, has been you know, making passes at China and saying, oh, you can't resist my Latino heat. And so some seed planting for the future here. The story here is Eddie fleeing from China whenever she's the legal woman. A cackling Grandmaster Sexay gets China to do a little dance. Sexay wants to go for the hip hop drop, but Saturn shoves him off the top. He puts on Sexay's do rag, which looks amazing. Guerrero drops Scotty into the ropes and gains the advantage, swivels his hips at China, then throws her into the ring post. What a contrast. Then he gets suplexed outside. Scotty too hottie with a double worm on Saturn and Malenko. The referee gets in between China and Guerrero, and Scotty gets beaten down. Saturn totally whiffs his top rope elbow drop, but they say he got enough of it to keep Scotty down. Eddie keeps trying to avoid China as she beats up Saturn and Malenko. Back to back handspring elbows and the double low blow. Eddie goes for a power bomb. China counters out of it and goes for her own, but she does not plant her feet well and it almost goes poorly. The testicular claw stops Eddie in his tracks. Get the press slam, the sleeper drop, the pin, and the win. I give it two stars out of five. This match was okay. I wouldn't call it WrestleMania quality per se. The match especially kind of breaks down when China makes her, her comeback at the end because it gets kind of clunky there. But seeing her get her kind of revenge or comeuppance on Eddie here uh, is definitely satisfying to watch. But oh, how the dynamic will change in just 24 hours. We hear from the winner of the WrestleMania All Day Long contest, a woman from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Shout out to Ian Riccoboni, by the way. So she won the contest and was flown from Allentown to Anaheim in one day and then whisked off to WrestleMania? Isn't she exhausted? How'd she even get there on time? We then see Shane McMahon backstage with the big show. Shane says the Vince era is out, the McMahon Helmsley era is passe. Tonight begins the Shane O'Mac era. The big show says some words about his opponents, and it's hard to believe that one night later the big show will want to become more entertaining. The most electrifying man in sports entertainment tonight gets unplugged. Game over. More WrestleMania debuts tonight in a two out of three triple threat match for both the Intercontinental and the European Championships as Kurt Angle defends both his belts against Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit. Angle is the second Eurocontinental champion in history after D'Lo Brown, just a few months into his outstanding rookie season, still going strong. He's being made to put both of his belts on the line in this unique match. First fall for the IC title, second fall for the European belt. Angle claims to be the victim of a conspiracy, but speaking of crazy talk, here comes Bob Backlund, the former world champion who he can't seem to escape apparently. He's helping Kurt out lately giving him advice, imparting the wisdom of the cross-faced chicken wing onto him. We find out on the heat before tonight's show that it was he who suggested that he put both belts on the line to toughen him up, do some tough love there, but Angle was having none of it. No word of Backlund actually said I quit when Kurt put him in the chicken wing. Early on, Jericho with a lovely triangle dropkick that sends both of his opponents flying off the apron. A few minutes later, Benoit blasts him off the top rope and to the outside. As the match goes on, the kid King begins to get confused not only about the rules of the match, but who's actually in it. Suppose neither Malenko, or Malenko, yeah, suppose neither uh, Chris Benoit can beat uh, Kurt Angle for either title. Benoit tries to steal a Jericho victory. Everyone breaks up each other's pins. Angle with a cross face chicken wing on Jericho. What do you say? What do you say? Benoit breaks it up, throws Angle out, hits the flying headbutt on Jericho to win the first fall and become the new Intercontinental Champion. Second fall begins. Angle goes up top and pays for it. Jericho and Benoit both get up there. Benoit suplexes Jericho. Angle with a moonsault but whiffs it. He always did the most beautiful missed moonsaults. Jericho somehow wills his way to a double powerbomb on Angle. He's got to work very hard to get him up in the second time. Soon he totally wrecks Tim White's shit with a collision. Benoit and Jericho each get their submissions and some tapping, but no referee. Angle decks Jericho with one of the titles, and I love the little exchange on commentary here. It's in Edmonton. That's where he lives. Yeah. Angle dodges a flying headbutt, but Jericho capitalizes with a lion salt onto Benoit, pins and wins the European title. The match is over, and Angle now has no belts. I give it four stars out of five. I love this match. Work horses, working like horses. You love to see it. A great work by all three men involved here. And the way they were able to get both the championships off of Angle without him being involved in either decision to keep him looking strong in the end is a pretty brilliant move, I would say. But the Chris Jericho era for the European title would not last very long. Long. One night afterward on Raw, he defends it against Eddie Guerrero, and China betrayed Chris to join up with a guy she'd beaten up just one night earlier. She loved the Latino heat, and it turned
Turns out that angle would be great for both of them. Michael Cole asks Vince McMahon if he'll be a factor in tonight's main event. Very diplomatic answer by Vince where he says whether he's in The Rock's corner or not does not affect The Rock's confidence. Will the other family members be factors? Cole asks. Vince reminds us that on SmackDown he promised he guaranteed he would make things right with him and his family. But elsewhere, Triple H heard that promo and says he will not allow himself to be beaten. And then we go to our semi-main event as the Road Dog and X-Pac of DX take on Kane and Rikishi, just part of the seemingly never-ending feud between X-Pac and Kane because X-Pac turned on him and then Tori, uh, Kane's girlfriend, betrayed him and joined with X-Pac. Now she's part of DX and it's been going on for freaking ever to the point where even X-Pac himself said he really wanted this angle to culminate at WrestleMania, even though he knew it was well past his shelf life, but he wanted it to, out of his own stubbornness, he wanted this angle to wrap up WrestleMania. He turned down a title match, an IC title match with Jericho, allegedly, in favor of this tag team match. Yikes. The D-O-double-G and X-Pac are teaming right now because Billy Gunn tore his rotator cuff in the tag title match against the Dudleys at No Way Out. He was beaten up by DX, kicked out of the group and written off for his surgery. We'd see him many months later as the one Billy Gunn. As far as the dynamics of the teams here, even though X-Pac and Road Dog were not as popular or successful a team as the New Age Outlaws, I would argue that functionally, just in the ring, they were a far better team. And of course, Rikishi, formerly Rikishi Fought 2, is one of the top baby faces at the moment, but without a program of his own, kind of gloms onto this one after fighting Triple H for a couple of times. Tori slaps Paul Bearer in the face before the match and gets spooked. Kane grabs her again, but X-Pac rescues his girlfriend like a good heel should. In the ring, a stink face to Road Dog, teasing one to Tori, but DX Vamoose the faces bring them back. X-Pac and Road Dog working over Rikishi, but Kane gets the hot tag. Kish tries to stink face on X-Pac, but he moves. Bear just throws Tori into the ring, and Kane hucks her into the corner, and now she gets the stink face. Tombstone to X-Pac. Kane and Rikishi wins. Too Cool come out to celebrate with Rikishi and the gang. Then out comes a San Diego chicken, and everyone thinks it's gotta be Pete Rose under the mask after what we saw the previous year. Too Cool, Rikishi, and the chicken dance while Kane just glares the chicken. He goozles the chicken, but then the real Pete Rose shows up with a baseball bat. Rikishi stops him. Kane hits the choke slam. Bear with the crotch chop. And finally, it's Pete Rose who gets one final stink face on the evening. I give it one star out of five. This match, not a lot of meat on the bone with this one, but the story is Kane getting his uh, revenge on X-Pac, so there's that. Seeing Pete Rose come for the hat trick three years in a row to appear to get beaten up by Kane and now Rikishi, I think it was a nice little closing to the trilogy with those two guys. His unhealthy fascination with assaulting Pete Rose. And yeah, this thing went on from beginning to end, from the beginning of the match to the end of the stuff with Pete Rose and everything. This whole thing went on for a long time. We get an awesome rock promo backstage. Then we see some celebrities hanging out during the show. R.I.P. Dustin Diamond. Then it's time for the main event. A McMahon in every corner. It's a four-way elimination match for the championship as Triple H defends against The Big Show, The Rock, and Mick Foley. Oh my, what a tangled web we weave. So at No Way Out, Triple H retired Mick Foley and The Rock defended his WrestleMania title match against The Big Show, who was the runner-up in the Rumble match, a.k.a. the rightful winner all along. Shane McMahon returned after a lengthy absence absence to help show beat The Rock. So officially for a time, the main event for WrestleMania 2000 was Triple H versus The Big Show. Oh boy. Well, after several weeks of fighting, The Rock finally earned his way to get that title match back thanks to a returning Vince McMahon, so it becomes a triple threat. On an episode of Raw, they gave that match away under the proviso we wouldn't get it again at Mania. Triple H won that match, but then Linda McMahon appeared, that fountain of charisma that she is, and she makes it a fatal four-way match with a returning Mick Foley as the fourth man, back from retirement for one night only, living his dream. I mean, the build of this match is insane. I didn't care for it much as a kid, and I definitely didn't like like watching it as an adult when I'm playing this back for research because this is the world title match and the biggest show of the year and the makeup of it is changing on almost a weekly basis between No Way Out and WrestleMania. In fact, I'm pretty sure we don't get the final crystallized version of this match until the like this like a SmackDown or two before Mania. And the big kicker of it is, you know, ultimately the focus isn't on the championship or even God forbid the participants, but the big man in every corner thing. They had to bring Linda in even though she can't act with the damn to make it symmetrical 
role. And, you know, I get it because the McMahon family drama was a big contributing factor to the rating success the Federation had during this time. I'm not going to be so anti McMahon family bullshit to think that it didn't have a, it didn't play a role in that. It did. But I think this angle here where the focus is all on that and then also to a lesser extent the invasion one year later, I think this is kind of the beginning of when the McMahon's equal ratings idea really jumps the shark. Fists are flying in the beginning. Foley leaps on the Big Show's back, but he gets squashed. Show goes for a choke slam, but Foley takes him to Dick Kick City. Everyone takes turns working over the show. Foley with a chair shot to the Big Show. The Rock with the him bottom. Show and Shane are gone. Lots of double teaming until Triple H ducks a bell attack. Foley producing the barbed wire 2x4, but Triple H avoids it with a low blow and decks Foley with it. Mick with the mandible claw on The Rock, but trips the double low blow. We see Triple H and Foley work together now. What kind of dark timeline is this? Foley decks The Rock with the steps. He dives off the second rope to the outside toward The Rock on the table, but he shorts it. Oh my god, that looked ugly. Triple H with the pedigree, but Foley kicks out and JR can't handle it. Triple H hits Earl Hebner. It's no DQ. Then dinks Foley with the chair. One more pedigree on that chair, but it didn't look as good. Foley is down for the count and is retired, quote, for good in giant air quotes. Foley is gone from the WWF, never to return again. He'll be back as commissioner in like two months. He takes one more shot at Triple H with the barbed wire before he leaves. Then we're down at Triple H and Rock. They fight their way up to the stage with some environmental damage. Back at ringside, Triple H covers Rock with some steps and whomps him with a chair and freaking pile drives him on the steps. The cover, the kick out. Rock goes for a him bottom, but it's blocked. The pedigree countered into a backdrop. Fighting in and out of the crowd, so many bells and whistles in this match. The Rock with a huge vertical suplex through the announce table. Vince takes a shot at Triple H. Shane McMahon comes back and beats up Vince. They fight about as well as you'd expect from these two excellent of execution. Vince kind of no-sells a monitor attack and comes back to beat up Shane. Shane dinks him with a chair and Vince is bleeding and is carried off and now we can care about the wrestlers again. Yay! Triple H decks The Rock with a 2x4. Shane gets in the ring but gets taken out with a slingshot from Triple H. The him bottom to Triple H but he can't capitalize. Vince comes back. He ejects Shane, grabs a chair, looks to go for Triple H but psych! Dinks The Rock instead. His own man. It's a Vincent Man swerve but somehow The Rock kicks out of that. Another chair shot Triple H covers and wins and retains, making him the first heel champion to ever retain the title at WrestleMania. Stephanie and Vince hug it out. All is well in the McMahon family again as trash fills the ring. The Rock recovers, hits the him bottom on Shane, on Vince, then on Stephanie, hits the people's elbow on Stephanie to send the crowd home happy because it's just what you did back then. We fade to black. I give it three stars out of five. You know, it was an okay match, all told, but okay is as good as I'm going to give it, and for the Mania main event, that's not a great thing to say. Uh, Mick Foley and Big Show, you could take them or leave them. I think they were kind of largely useless in this matchup. Uh, the story was really The Rock versus Triple H, and this match was done to kind of flesh that out, pat it out a little bit, I would say. Uh, Vincent Man turning was highly inevitable. You couldn't stay a face forever, I guess. Yeah, not much to say about this one. I mean, they would, they would go on to keep The Rock... And Triple H angle going, and Vince turning heel would extend the life of this feud for several months going into Backlash, King of the Ring, and so forth. My grade for WrestleMania 2000 is a D plus. You know, uh, this I think, show proves that even during the height of the Attitude Era, Booking a WrestleMania is harder than it seems, and they had a lot of great character work on this show, and I think that was one of the big hallmarks of the Attitude Era, was character work above in-ring action. I think this show really hammers that point home, because the in-ring action here is not worth talking about by and large. The Triangle Ladder match and the Triple Threat match for the titles are the clear exceptions to that rule. Those are definitely Mania quality matches, and those can those have earned their place living in the history and the pantheon of WrestleMania matches. Everything else, though, about this show, even the main event, is really not worth watching again. I guess, in a way, a more proof that this show is kind of like the Ewoks of WWE, in that it's a polarizing show, and it almost kind of tarnishes the legacy of the event itself. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have a chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Well, season 10 has just wrapped up here on the channel, so after this episode, I'm taking a little bit of a break. Don't be too alarmed. During that time,